Hey, hey. By the way, I forgot to mention, I, I actually watched the live stream last Sunday or so. Oh, yeah. From, from the, from the, the sound was good. So, someone had mentioned that the sound wasn't good for me. Yeah, on, well, on the website, it isn't. Fanny oh. and I were looking at the So what, what hymns do you want to start off with this morning? Nobody wants to sing? You'll have to wave your hand around trying to play this, otherwise I won't be able to see it. I know Doug has a whole list, and if you don't, I don't know if you don't find it, he's singing Doug's favorite hymns all summer. We did.
Yes, we can sing all the verses of this. Yeah. All one of them. <laughs> How many languages? Yeah. Well, we can try the verse in French if you want. Welcome to worship with Trinity Grace United Church here in beautiful East Vancouver. We believe God is at work in the world, in our neighborhood, and among us. And that the Spirit calls us together week by week, moment by moment, to nurture our faith, find Christ's welcome in each other, helping us to be a community of love and unconditional welcome for all want to acknowledge with gratitude that those of us here in person are gathering on a traditional and unceded territory of the of Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And this congregation, we reaffirm our commitment to the sacred and important work of truth and reconciliation. Spirit calls us into our time together, and we begin by lighting our Christ candle, recalling that the light is both amongst us and within us. Let us worship in the light. Our intro this morning is uh, in Voices United, it's number 400, Lord, listen to your children praying. Let's listen to Melody sing it through once and then we'll sing it through twice.
Welcome, friends, neighbors, visitors, people of God. We come as seekers and companions on the road of faith. Slow down the pace, take a deep breath, and bask in the presence of our God. Whoever we are, wherever we've come from, God loves us. us. Come, let us be neighbors in this place. Let us encounter God together. We are our holy ground. ground. Christ's Spirit is with us. On our first uh, hymn for the service is In More Voices, number 42. Uh, feel free to remain seated or stand as you prefer. <laughs> persistent presence in our lives, forgiving us when we cannot forgive ourselves, comforting us in times of tension and turmoil, healing our hurts and restoring peace in our frantic lives, calling forth our best while loving us without condition. In this moment, we bring to you the totality of who we are, the light and the shadow, that which we show to the world, and that which we keep in. We, we pray to you now, trusting that you continue to shape and transform us, to heal and renew us in love and grace. Friends, hear this good news. In Jesus Christ, God's generous love reaches out to embrace each of us, to forgive us, to renew us, to set our feet back on the path of life. May we trust in this promise. Friends, I say to you, the peace of Christ. 
is what you are. And so you say oh. <laughs> the peace of Christ is with us all. And yes, you can still <laughs> offer your own sign of peace, however that looks for you. And now our reading from scripture. <laughs> Friends, will you be with me in prayer? God of wisdom, as we listen to your word recorded by generations of your people, fill us with understanding by the power of your Holy Spirit. Reveal the mysteries of faith to us so that we may grow in faithfulness following Jesus, your living word. Amen. Our reading today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit life, eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you gave the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, giving them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three, do you think, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, here we have it, the Good Samaritan, Jesus' famous, well-worn, well-loved parable. So familiar that I was tempted to skip the gospel reading for today. Uh, there are three, four, multiple readings that are set for each, uh, each week of the church year. Uh, and perhaps to pass it over for perhaps the prophet Amos, holding a plumb line in the midst of the people, which would be the uh, Older Testament reading for today. But for something uh, kept drawing me back to the parable this time around. In part, I think it was the temptation around, I was having some thoughts around what title I could give my sermon. When your enemy is your neighbor. Who are the people in your neighborhood? Family feud. I kind of like that one. Or maybe it was a temptation to start with a joke. A priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan walk into a bar. 
But part of it, I think, is just the fact of this parable being so familiar as it is. I wanted to see if we could dig a little, go underneath a bit, perhaps forestall that natural inclination we have when we hear a really familiar story uh, to just jump to the moral and think we know, you know what it's about. Don't need to listen. Now, when I just said I was tempted to title this sermon Family Feud, uh, this is for a good reason. There are many references to Samaritans in the Bible, and the Samaritan, of course, features in this parable. And uh, if we look back, for example, um, to Books of Kings, we find out that the relationship and the bad blood between these two groups, between Jews and Samaritans, goes back to at least 700 BCE. Kings refers to Israelites being removed from Samaria when they were conquered by, this, by the Assyrians. And the Assyrians brought in Babylonians and people from other nations and allowed them to populate this area uh, in place of the Israelites. But some apparently um, practiced the Israelite religion as well. But, and I'm quoting here, every nation still made gods of its own and placed them in the shrines of the high places which the Samaritans had made. They also feared the Lord and from among themselves, they appointed all sorts of people as priests of the high places who sacrificed for them in the shrines of the high places. So we're hearing that, that the Samaritans or the new people populating Samaria feared the Lord, which means they followed the Israelite religion, but also served their own gods, the ones they had before they came, after the manner of the nations from where, where they came from. So not so good. They built shrines, they sacrificed, they made anyone who wanted it uh, into a priest. Uh, they allowed images of other gods to be put in the shrine. So in the Babylonian Talmud, which is full of rabbinic commentary, the question is asked, why are Samaritans excluded from entering Israel? It was a real divide, an historic divide. The answer, because they were mixed up with the priests of the high places, and because they marry illegitimate women, but not a brother's widow, which is the law. So in other words, they're not following the law as we understand it. Apparently, according to Jewish historian Josephus, if we fast forward to 333 BC, the people living in Samaria were being referred to as apostates from the Jewish people. So people exiled from Israel for breaking laws, for denouncing core beliefs, and again, if anyone was charged, and this is Josephus writing, if anyone was charged by Jerusalemites with eating unclean things or with violating the Sabbath or other some such sin, he fled to the Sessionites, which is the home base of the Samaritans. So we go back to the Talmud. Next question. When will the Samaritans be accepted? The answer when they deny Mount Gerizim and confess Jerusalem. I bet you're wondering what that means. <laughs> so did I, when they deny Mount Gerizim and confess Jerusalem. So we go back to Josephus, who tells his readers that at that time, the Samaritans had their capital at this place called Seshem, which lies beside, you guessed it, Mount Gerizim. And they built their own temple there on the mountain. And that, it seemed, added further fuel to the proverbial fire with respect to this Jewish Samaritan feud. Josephus again helps illuminate when he writes, now about 180 BCE in Alexandria, which is Egypt, the Jews and the Samaritans who worshiped on Mount Gerizim at the temple happened to quarrel with each other. And they debated about their temples before Ptolemy. 
the Jews said the one in Jerusalem was built according to the law of Moses, and the Samaritans said the one built on Mount Gerizim was built according to the law of Moses. And so they called on what was called the king in session to hear their arguments. They had to present their arguments in front of the king. And according to Josephus, and then called on the king to put the losers of the argument to death. So this wasn't just an academic argument. And apparently the king was eventually persuaded in favor of Jerusalem. And the Samaritan contingent was executed. Not only that, but in 128 BCE, a Jewish king attacked Samaria and apparently burned down the temple on Mount Gerizim. It eventually ended up getting rebuilt uh, sometime later. So then we fast forward all the way to Jesus' day, 9 CE, when Jesus was a child. But here again from Josephus, there was yet another incident. It wasn't that long a period of time with no incidents, but the next one sort of worthy of recording for history sake. There was another incident, this time on the evening of the Passover festival, as was the custom of the Jewish priests. They opened the gates of the temple at midnight on the evening of Passover. And some Samaritans apparently had a plan, a plot, and they snuck into the temple at night, scattered human bones throughout the areas of the temple, effectively desecrating the temple. Now this just skims the bare surface of the history of the enmity between the Samaritans and the Jews. But as we can see, it was a deep rooted feud with each group claiming to be the true descendants of Abraham and to have the true understanding and version of the law, the Torah, claiming to have the true priesthood and the legitimate temple. And in Jesus' day, the entrenched norm at that point was to avoid these groups to avoid social contact whenever possible. So here we have this long-standing, bitter, on again, off again, complicated enmity that existed. And this is the context um, into which Jesus tells his parable. And hopefully having a bit of the understanding of that history is helpful for us in being able to get a sense of how this parable might have landed for those listening to Jesus tell this parable. In fact, the story is all the more shocking when we recall that in Luke's gospel, just before this story, Jesus had just been refused hospitality at a Samaritan village that he went to because the policy of exclusion worked both ways. For both groups. And when James and John, Luke recounts, wanted to bring down God's punishment on the village for refusing the hospitality, Jesus had to remind them that raining down fire on people isn't actually the right response to a lack of hospitality. Now, knowing the history also perhaps helps us make a bit more sense of the title that this story has traditionally been given, the story of the Good Samaritan. In actuality, Jesus never refers to the Samaritan as good. It only makes sense to add this descriptor, good, if the goodness of the person couldn't be assumed in the story. And I suppose from the perspective of first century hearers, a good Samaritan would have caught their attention and would have been received as an oxymoron. Now, of course, since the story has now seeped so deeply into our cultural lexicon, the Good Samaritan has, over time, come to be used to describe, as you know, someone's extraordinary act of coming to someone else's aid. We actually hear people uh, who have gone out of their way to help someone call Good Samaritans in news articles on almost a daily basis. And partly because it's been culturalized and whitewashed into a story about the moral good of helping people in need, and be part, partly because of the familiarity of it as beloved Christian text, it can be difficult to feel for us to feel the challenge of this particular story. 
Amy Jill Levine, who's a professor of New Testament and Jewish studies, famously once suggested that religion is meant to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> and you may also have heard, heard that phrase used by an Old Testament scholar we have here with us in the congregation. And many of Jesus' parables were designed to do just that, afflict the comfortable, the comfortably secure, the comfortably wealthy, and the comfortably self-righteous. They're designed to lay us comfortable folks bare. So let's just take a little bit of a closer look. The beginning of the passage, a lawyer, and this isn't a, a, a lawyer as we would understand it, a secular lawyer, but, but a religious lawyer. So a lawyer of the, the law, of uh, the Jewish law. And he approaches Jesus with a question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And just a sidebar about the question itself, it isn't really uh, an upfront, genuine question. Uh, it's actually posed as a test, a test for Jesus. And you can kind of hear it in the perhaps sense of entitlement in the question itself as he uses the word inherit. So it's about what do I need to do to get this? It's about me and my accessing this privilege of eternal life. Jesus, as he often does, responds first by asking the learned questioner, what does the law say? And of course, the lawyer knows, the lawyer's a smart guy. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And so Jesus says, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. That's not enough for this lawyer. So he follows up. And who is my neighbor? And at that, perhaps sensing even more clearly the motivation behind the question, Jesus decides to flip things. He tells the parable of the Samaritan, and then he turns and he asks the lawyer, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? To which, of course, the lawyer has to reply, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says again, go and do likewise. And in that turn, that turning of the question from who is my neighbor to who was the neighbor to that man in need, Jesus takes the focus off who should be helped, who's worthy of our help and places it squarely on the helper. In other words, don't worry about who might need your help, who might deserve your help, who you have to help and who you don't. What made the Samaritan in the parable a neighbor? Was it any one or combination of actions that he took with respect to the injured man? Was it that he was moved with pity? Was it that he went to the man and bandaged up his wounds? Was it that before he bandaged the wounds, he uh, anointed the man, poured oil and wine on the wounds? Was it the fact that he put the man on his very own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of them? Or was it because the next day he took out two denarii, the equivalent of two paydays, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And thus ensuring the ongoing well-being of this man and then the, the chance of recovery. Or what if the Samaritan was a neighbor simply because he made the choice to go near, to approach the man as he was lying in the ditch, to decrease that distance um, between him and the person in need. When we see someone in need, in distress, in an emergency, isn't the most difficult part of us taking action, uh, overcoming that moment of fear, of indecision, um, to actually engage the situation? One commentator asks, what if eternal life, what if the kingdom of God is known here and now where we are in our nearness, in our proximity to one another. 
in the decision for us to be closer and not looking for ways to push away or disengage. And I'm thinking of this in a general sense, in this age of individualization and suspicion sometimes of each other's motives. But I'm also thinking back to the feud and the willingness and our willingness to stay near, to stay in the neighborhood, if you will, with those we disagree with, sometimes vehemently. For what is a neighbor or a neighborhood, if not a person or a group of people who are in community together in relationship with each other, who are willing to be community to each other when one of them is in need? So I was thinking about my co-op. It feels like a community like that. We're there for each other. We don't always agree. Some of us let our dogs roam and poop on each other's lawns. Some of us can see the body language right there as I think about it. Some of us play our music too loud outside when we're washing our cars or having our barbecues. Uh, but were there to be an emergency, we'd be there for each other. The community would rally. And of course, my annoyances with my neighbors absolutely pale in comparison with the kind of enmity we're talking about here in Jesus' context. But what if, for example, I knew that my co-op neighbor was a far-right conservative evangelical Christian who, in my view, has a distorted view of the gospel and participates in harming others through that worldview or perpetuating that worldview? What if I had witnessed my neighbor threatening another neighbor? What if I'm a villager in occupied France whose son has been killed in the fighting and who comes across a severely wounded German soldier? One suggestion that's been made regarding this passage is that at least in part, either Jesus or Luke would have been drawing upon an actual earlier biblical account uh, from Second Chronicles. It tells of a time when the Samaritans captured uh, hundreds of thousands of Judean women, men, and children with the intention of, car they carted them off with the intention of making them slaves. And a prophet at the time apparently condemned the Samaritan army. And as a result, some of the leaders listened, were listening to the prophet. And we hear in Second Chronicles, then those who were mentioned by name got up and took the captives and with all they had taken, all they had stolen in their pillaging, they clothed the captives, they gave them sandals, they provided them with food and drink and anointed them. And carrying all the weak among them on their own donkeys, they brought them back to their own people at Jericho. That's quite a striking parallel there between that and the parable of Jesus. The final thing I want to mention is this parallel between the priest and the Levite in the story Jesus tells and the lawyer who asked Jesus the question. For all of them, the internal thought process seems to be very self-centric, as I mentioned. How will helping someone affect me? Will it allow me to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, as he often does, reframes the question in this case, asking a different question, which forces the lawyer and us to focus on the other rather than on ourselves. What's in it for me? The hated Samaritan in the story is the one who overcomes the natural inclination to respond from a, how will my actions affect me stance to a, how will my actions affect this other person? And in doing so, Jesus reminds his hearers that just feeling compassion isn't enough. Oh, look at that poor guy over there. It's the acting on the compassion that counts. This is what God does in so much of our biblical account. God shows mercy through acting to save the people, even when they sinned against God. And here's Jesus saying, go and do likewise. <coughs> I like the suggestion of one commentator who says, in the end, the Good Samaritan is the one who comes near as one who knows the kingdom is near, as near as our willingness to become neighbors to each other, to everyone, including, let's be honest, 
those we feel we have every good reason to be angry and aghast with, to even despise, in fact. So many questions arise from this text, but the most important one for us perhaps is, are we feeling afflicted yet? The kingdom is near, the way is fulfilled, says Jesus, when we put our compassion and our common humanity first, taking ourselves and our fragility out of the center of the equation and tending to each other in our time of need and vulnerability. The despised, hated Samaritan did that. Will we go and do likewise? And on the flip side, can we allow for the possibility of the enemy being there for us in our time of need, being the compassionate one, being the hero? And I think we can all think of some people we'd rather not want to come to our assistance in a time of need. And yet, here we have the story. And in allowing for those possibilities for us or for them to mercifully step over historic and entrenched and sometimes violent lines, separating us from them, one small act at a time, might we participate in God's holy work of breaking the cycles of violence that keep us at odds with each other. May it be so with God's mercy and grace. Perhaps unsurprisingly, our next hymn is entitled When I Needed a Neighbor. It is number 600 in your red hymn. This is our time of uh, taking a few minutes to connect together. I have a couple of announcements and then I'll see if you have anything you would like to share 
or a prayer request. Uh, so on Friday evening, we had our first sacred jazz concert. Uh, this has been a while in the making and COVID has uh, had kind of thrown our schedule off for getting this started. Um, Dan Reynolds, who's a musician at Brentwood Presbyterian, brought a quintet, uh, including a, a tap dancer, and they performed the Prodigal Son Suite. And I think uh, I can speak for most of us who are here. Uh, it was really, really moving and a really interesting experience. And I just found out um, this morning that the video is now up on our website. So we go to our homepage and uh, it, the link will be right there on the home page. You can view it. Um, also, just wanted to give you a quick update that our search team for the Minister of Community Engagement had its first meeting this past week, some one of those days, <laughs> Wednesday, Thursday. And uh, the members of the search team just wanted you to know, we'll be putting some written announcements into the bulletin as we move along in the process. But uh, the members are Brenda Harrison, Sally Marcantonio, Doug Jameson, uh, Mariana Harris, Mia Stark, and myself. And we met with Mark Colomb, who's the regional minister, uh, to get us started. And the position description is now up on uh, the portal called Church Hub, where ministers looking for a position can look for open positions. I also wanted to, to ask your prayers. Some of you will have heard, but if you hadn't, just ask your prayers uh, for Ed Cannell. Um, and he suffered a stroke last week, and um, he is uh, hopefully going to be going home soon. So that is good news. Uh, but he and Cheryl and their family would appreciate your, your ongoing prayers. Have something to share, or if I have also forgotten any significant church news, let me know or for a request, and we'll, we'll hold those in our prayers. Um, yeah, yesterday I um, had a message from um, Leanne's sister Shelley and um, saying that Leanne had had a fall about a week ago, broken her elbow. <laughs> Can't imagine how painful that is, and um. We'll need to go for some rehab. She's, I think she's in Burnaby General right now, but I don't know. They're just waiting to move her into Bowburn Care Home for rehab. So, um, yeah, and she, I'm, I'm going to try and go see her tomorrow if she's still there, but Shelley's going to let me know. And also, our friend Julie, who we all know from downstairs in the thrift store, she had surgery on Thursday and will be recuperating at home with her sister there from Edmonton area. Yeah, I think that's it. So um, I know they would both appreciate our prayers for the healing and future. So yeah, I heard from Julie and uh, she had a usual good sense of humor about the hospital food that was meant to be a vegetable medley. But it was like a green <laughs> mess and yeah, <laughs> she wasn't thrilled. I didn't need it, but I'm sure she's, she's, she's really funny. She's, yeah. She was good. Yeah. We'll see. Maybe we have a couple of cards we can sign. Yeah. 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 Any other concerns? Well, we'll move into our prayers of the people, and, uh, and there'll be some time of silence. We offer your own prayers in silence. So I'd like to. So this morning our prayers are responsive, to, so the invitation, God of life, I invite you to respond with, hear our prayer. Let us pray. God of abundant growth, as summer unfolds around us, we give you thanks for warm, sunny days, for beauty in our gardens, crops growing in our fields, life swimming in oceans and lakes, where the abundance of nature is at risk. We pray that your spirit will work in and through us and with the cooperation of nations and leaders everywhere to restore the air, water and soil for the good of all creation. God of every life, 
Hear our prayer. God of peace and justice and reconciliation, we thank you for the peace and freedom we enjoy and the many ways our lives are protected in this land. We remember before you those torn apart, those places torn apart by violence and hate, those people who face discrimination daily, and those fighting for their basic human rights to be recognized. We pray for those who face barriers to employment, housing, and for those experience food and economic insecurity. We pray for anyone who is feeling unsafe or unsupported. God and love, good and loving God, we know you desire abundant life for us all. Guide leaders and policy makers in your ways of peace and justice. God of life, yeah, hear our prayer. God of creativity and community, we thank you for the many ways the church can serve you in Jesus' name. Thank you for the unique voices that sing your praise and speak your comfort all the hands that share in acts of service, all the prayers offered quietly for your will to be done. We, thank, we pray for this congregation as we seek to be faithful. Help us work together so that our community and relationships can bear witness to the transforming power of your love. God of every life, hear our prayer. God of every precious life, our hearts ache for those who are suffering. Hear our prayers as we name before you those in need of your love and healing power. And we pray for Ed, Leanne and Julie. Life-giving God, may your spirit sustain and bring peace and renewal to those we have named before you. God of every life, Hear our prayer. God, hope and love, draw us closer to you every day. Show us what you desire for us and inspire our faithfulness in the example of Jesus, who taught us to pray together in community. Loving God, source of life, may your name be held sacred by all creation. May your reign come and your holy will be done. Here among us, as in the great communion of saints, provide what we need to sustain us today. Forgive our sins as we forgive the earth's we absolve from others. Keep us from trials to the great despair and strengthen us to resist evil. For yours is the realm of love, yours the energy of life, and yours the true essence of all that is, now and always. Amen. Our last hymn is Go Make a Difference. More voices, two of them.
going to make music readers out of all of us. <laughs> I didn't know before, you know, where you pass. Friends, as we go now, remember wherever you go, you are on holy ground. Rejoice, persevere, extend hospitality. Let your words and actions witness to the Spirit's sacred presence in the midst of all life. And may God's blessing call forth peace and love from you to the world. Thanks for joining us this week. Blessings.